Hello, everyone. I am Danny Warshe. I'm the executive director of the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. And I am so excited to kick off this, this uh, event. It is one of my absolute favorite days, Brown Venture Prize Competition Pitch Night. Uh, pitch Night might be a little bit of a misnomer for many of you. Uh, we looked at where some of you are calling in from, and we see even in the chat and in some of your comments, and you're from all over the world. So we didn't want to be too provincial and assume that we would call this night or say good evening. For those of you in Providence or the East Coast, certainly good evening, but for many of you, it's good afternoon, and some of you, it's good morning. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, I'm really thrilled and excited to be uh, welcoming you, you to this event. This event, as it turns out, has had more registrants than any event in the Nelson Center's history, over 500. And I know we're gonna build up throughout the evening. Uh, and so I suspect it's gonna be the biggest event that Nelson has ever had. And that is a testament to all of you. It's a testament to my fellow Nelson Center teammates. It's a testament to the amazing uh, student teams you're about to hear and to the judges. Uh, but it's also an indication of how exciting entrepreneurship has become on College Hill and now remotely all over the world. And we're really thrilled to be leading that effort at Brown. One thing that I did want to comment on is that we do miss you. We miss our community. Uh, normally, my backdrop would show a virtual background of the Nelson Center. That's about as close as I've gotten to our building in just about a year. And that's that's a sad thing, but we're gearing up, we hope sooner than later to be back in the building. In the meantime, we are thrilled at how enthusiastically you and so many others related to Brown have embraced all of the Nelson Center's remote activity. And we encourage you to keep doing that until we're back in the building. Uh, in the meantime, for tonight at least, I wanna encourage you all to the extent you can and are willing to turn on your cameras because we'd like to see your smiling faces uh, we'd like to, to have UCRs and at least continue to build as much of, of a virtual uh, Nelson Center community as we possibly can. Uh, I want to thank uh, two sets of people. One is uh, Luke Sherwin and Neil Parikh, who were the um, original inspiration for this kind of event. I'm not sure it's exactly what they had in mind, but um, they came to us in 2017 and said there was something like this. Uh, sponsored by Brown Entrepreneurship Program when we were students, and it had a big impact on how we thought about entrepreneurship and the pursuit of entrepreneurship after we left Brown. We would like to fund something for a couple of years that would look so like something similar, and they did. And so thank you for, for doing that, not only for thinking about it, but for uh, investing in the first uh, two years. And very much thank Richard Katzman and Jane Katzman for their oh, ongoing cool. support last year and then re-upping again this year. We could not do what we're doing uh, in respect to the Brown Venture Prize without your support. And that's true of so many of you who are on this event right now. Uh, you're looking at me, I'm about 25% of our full-time staff and uh, we couldn't possibly do all that we do without the engagement and generous contributions of all kinds from all sorts of alumni and parents and other affiliates of Brown. So thank you. And then lastly, thank you to our staff. Like I said, we're a lean operation, which is the way we should be as a venture, uh, an entrepreneurship venture. And uh, really good work from Abby and Liz who managed every single detail of tonight. Jonas for working closely with all the teams. Sheila for all of her organizational efforts and all the other people affiliated uh, with the Nelson Center. I always like to take the opportunity to plug a couple of things coming up. We recently launched, as I hope you all saw in your email, uh, a program called Nelson at Five. Believe it or not, we are celebrating our fifth year uh, since our founding back in 2016. Hard to believe. And we are um, releasing a series of videos on different themes related to the three buckets that we always talk about, curricular, co-curricular, and what tonight's event is all about, venture support. And so stay tuned. You'll see a number of those, of those videos coming out over the next several months. I also want to plug an event coming up uh, this weekend, 
on Saturday called Startup at Brown. And we're gonna be posting in the chat uh, some links to these kinds of events and to other things. And I encourage you all to also sign up for attending uh, Startup at Brown. There will be a few entrepreneurship certificate info sessions coming up over the next uh, week or so. And uh, that's a really good, exciting program that's part of that first bucket, uh, curricular. And then I want to encourage you all, if you can, to stay on for the entire event. We will very quickly be transitioning for you to hear from eight ventures. You're going to hear from each of them doing their uh, pitch in four minute video format, and then live answering questions from two of the judges. And then we will um, have the judges go off separately and deliberate. And while they're doing that, we have a number of exciting things to share with you. One is a fan favorite vote. And so we're gonna encourage you all to participate in the fan favorite and there'll be a special prize for the winner of the fan favorite. We have a really special announcement that I'm super excited about from Van Wickle Ventures, our student run venture fund related to one of the past winners. And so I hope you'll stick around for that announcement. And then we've compiled a really special video. It's a compilation of insights from past winners, what the Brown Venture Prize competition has meant to them in terms of propelling them on their own entrepreneurship trajectory. And it's a compilation in a, a video that we'll be playing while the judges deliberate. And if we even need another video, we'll play you the Nelson at Five video, but uh, the, the judges have the work cut out for them in order to uh, stick to our timeline. Uh, I at first was asked to quote, introduce our judges. And I thought that's not gonna work. There's just way too much to say about each of the judges. So instead I modified that and in my own notes, I have acknowledge our judges, which I think is a little bit more realistic. At the same time, uh, we don't wanna deprive you of knowing all the wonderful accomplishments and contributions to Brown and to the Nelson Center from all of these judges. And so Abby right now is putting in the chat uh, a link to on our website, the um, program for tonight, which lists in detail the bios of all the judges and in detail the bios and descriptions of all the eight ventures from whom you're gonna hear soon. But at least to just whet your appetite, I'll mention that Bernadette, who um, is uh, featured here on screen, is an advisor, an investor, a former HBO executive, and a member of the Brown Corporation. I'd be remiss if I didn't say for all of you, and it's true for Bernadette, uh, absolutely, that uh, they have all contributed significantly to the Nelson Center in all ways. Really appreciate your being here, Bernadette. Ben um, is one of this year's entrepreneurs in residence, one of two. Uh, he's the co-founder of Imperfect Foods, He's also now moved on to the side of uh, entrepreneurship, teaching entrepreneurship as associate director of entrepreneurship at the Rue Institute at Northeastern University. Uh, I'm a history concentrator, Brown class of 87. And as I've done previously when Ben has spoken, I always love looking back to primary documents because history concentrators love to read and remember history. And I dug up the personal statement that Ben, you wrote in order to get into my class. This was back in fall of 2015. And I just love this quote that I'll excerpt. You said, uh, when you were just a student, I believe that I personally can have the greatest positive impact in the world by leveraging the power of markets to create scalable social ventures. And I couldn't imagine a more prescient kind of comment for what you've gone on to do. So thank you, Ben. Thank you for being an EIR this year and for all the other wonderful contributions you've made. Richie, uh, you're, our, you're, you're also an entrepreneur in residence this year and you've, you've hit the ground running, sprinting, I would say. You're already um, a uh, rave success here uh, among students. People rave about you and the kinds of tutelage and counseling you've given to them. Uh, the mentorship. So we we are really thrilled that you're an EIR this year. You're the founder of the Richie Life and Bambini Wear. And uh, so you are an accomplished entrepreneur on your own. And uh, we really appreciate your
being here tonight and also contributing so much uh, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, Richard, I mentioned to you before, um, you're making this uh, tonight happen and we really appreciate that just as you and Jane did last year. You are a member of the President's Advisory Council on Entrepreneurship. You're a very accomplished entrepreneur for almost all of your career. Um, you're an investor, member of the New York Angels Group, and for more years than I can count, you uh, were extraordinarily generous in supporting what I guess we would describe as a student-led precursor to the Nelson Center called Brown Entrepreneurship Program. So thank you so much for all that you do and all that you're continuing to do. Anisha, I first met you when you were um, in my, came to my class as one of the venture capitalists to whom the student ventures in my course pitched. Uh, you're a principal at Bain Capital Ventures. You've contributed in all sorts of ways already uh, in the Nelson Center's last few years. And um, we really appreciate all that you're doing. The students rave about you too, and uh, all that you contribute, all the perspective you give them to their um, nascent ventures. So thank you for being here tonight. Jessica, you're the co-founder of TrueFit, and uh, I love awesome. hearing from you in some of our discussions about how you wished the Nelson Center existed when you were a student. I can uh, share in that as well. And uh, your enthusiasm is just bursting. You, you wear it on your sleeve. And so uh, I love hearing from our students who love what you contribute to them. Thank you for being here tonight, for all that you do and rolling up your sleeves to help us do what we do at the Nelson Center. Luke, I mentioned very briefly um, that you were really responsible for what, keeping what up this the whole ETA? kind of initiative. And uh, yes. you two are a uh, member of the President's Advisory Council on Entrepreneurship. You're the co-founder of Casper and Block. And in the fall of 09, I dug up your personal statement too. You wrote, I have always assumed that learning how to spot the value in an idea or a business is one of the greatest skills an entrepreneur can have. And so you've certainly um, developed that skill uh, while you were at Brown and since you've graduated. And uh, it makes you only so appropriate for all the kind of work and generous contribution you make to the Nelson Center, to our students, and also appropriate for you to be a judge tonight. Thank you. And uh, finally, Melanie, um, we really appreciate your being here with us tonight. Uh, I remember the first time you and I spoke and you were bursting with enthusiasm about what the uh, Nelson Center's promise was. And uh, we really appreciate your stepping up to uh, be helpful to us in all the ways that you do. You're the managing director at Summit Partners and the former CEO of SoulCycle, a combination of doing entrepreneurship and uh, investing behind entrepreneurs. And I can't imagine a better combination that qualifies you to be a judge tonight. Thank you for doing that. So we're gonna transition very quickly to uh, the next steps in the actual competition. I wanna explain just very briefly, as I mentioned, each, uh, each time I reference one of the eight teams, you're gonna hear a four minute video pitch. That's the only reason we're doing that is because of uh, this remote format, but actually we did it last year, it worked really well and I know it's gonna work well this year. And then I will introduce two judges who will in four minutes ask um, a couple of questions uh, and interact live with each of the teams. So in total, you, hear, you will hear eight pitches in video form and also in, um, uh, Q&A form. So uh, if we're ready to move on, let's hear our first pitch, Bolden. Hi, my name is Johnny Page. I'm the founding CEO of Bolden Therapeutics, and our mission is to develop new therapies for the treatment of brain disease, such as Alzheimer's disease. This is a picture of me and my grandma taken about five years ago. Unfortunately, she has Alzheimer's disease, and for patients like her, there exists no good treatment options. This is obviously something that's very deeply personal to me and to my family, and I'm sure to many of you. Alzheimer's disease is a huge problem. In fact, there are over 40 million people today living with Alzheimer's disease, and this number is expected to continue to grow unless meaningful therapies are developed. In addition, Alzheimer's disease is an incredibly costly disease, costing around $300 billion per year in the United States alone, 
and is expected to increase to astronomical levels if no disease-modifying therapies are developed. To give you a little bit of an overview on the disease, here we're looking at MRI images, and on the left, a healthy patient, and on the right, a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And the biggest difference that you'll notice is that there's a lot more black space in the brain of the patient with Alzheimer's disease. This is where brain cells used to be. These are brain cells that have died due to this terrible disease. And so intuitively, there are two potential ways that one might have an impact on this disease. The first would be to slow the loss of, these, of the death of these cells. And the second would be to increase the formation of new cells. The vast majority of research efforts to date have focused on the former, in particular on two proteins, one known as amyloid, which forms plaques in the brain, as you can see here on this image, and the other known as tau, which forms tangles. All of these research efforts have unfortunately not led to a FDA-approved therapeutic, and this is due to either a lack of efficacy, unwanted side effects, or both. Accordingly, there is a vast opportunity for new therapeutic approaches. Recent research has implicated the process of neurogenesis, or the formation of new brain cells, as a potential therapeutic target in Alzheimer's disease. As you can see here, patients with Alzheimer's disease have approximately 30% the rate of new neuron formation compared to patients that do not have Alzheimer's disease. Intuitively, therapeutic efforts that could make it so that patients with Alzheimer's disease have an increased rate of new brain cell formation so that they are more like their cognitively normal counterparts here shown in the figure, that might have a powerful impact on the course of disease. At Bolden, we've discovered a way to do exactly that. Here on the left, you're looking at an image of a mouse brain in a normal mouse, and on the right, mouse brain with our treated mouse. And the difference that you'll see, as indicated by these white arrowheads in the figure, is that we observe the increased formation of new brain cells compared to normal mice. In addition, we've observed increased performance on a cognition task in our mice, suggesting that our mice not only have increased formation of new brain cells, but also improved cognitive function. This paves the way for a potential Alzheimer's therapeutic, and this is what motivates Bolden's mission to translate this research. I'm incredibly honored to have founded this company with my former thesis advisor, Justin Fallon, who's a professor of neuroscience at Brown, as well as Ashley Webb, who's an assistant professor of molecular and cell biology at Brown, we have a great team of advisors and consultants as well. In terms of our progress to date, we were incorporated a little over a year ago. We've received some pre-seed funding and we've been expanding our team. We've negotiated for the IP coming out of Brown and we were recently awarded the Lab Central Golden Ticket, which provides us with a year long of lab space in Kendall Square at no cost to us. Looking ahead, there are a number of studies that need to be conducted preclinical proof of concept studies, preclinical toxicology studies, efficacy studies, and other safety studies. Basically, as much information as we can possibly gather to ensure that the drug candidate that may ultimately make it into patients is as safe and effective as possible. This is a lengthy and costly journey, but we're highly motivated by this exciting research, and we are looking forward to having the opportunity to potentially impact the lives of patients suffering from these diseases. Thank you very much. Great. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anisha and Richard and ask you both to make sure you're unmuted. You are. Great. Thank you. Anisha. Great. Yeah, thanks, team. Uh, really interesting space, obviously. Really interesting research. I'm having a little bit of trouble understanding exactly what the next milestones look like and what you need to get there in terms of capital, in terms of time, in terms of team. My understanding from some of this is that you've, you've tested this in healthy mice, maybe not in Alzheimer's mice. So we'd, we'd love to really understand what that looks like, what the next couple of milestones look like and how you think you can achieve them. Sure, thank you, that's a great question. So um, it's one of the reasons why we're uh, hopeful about the Brown Venture Prize, because we find ourselves at an interesting point in the life cycle of a biotech company where we have this very encouraging data. Uh, we've received uh, inbound interest from uh, investment groups and from pharmaceutical companies, and there's been a lot of excitement about the data that we have so far. However, as you pointed out, these are manipulations in normal mice and in otherwise healthy mice. And so what will be really exciting is to see if we can do the same intervention in mice that have, you know, their models of Alzheimer's disease in mice. So if we could do the same intervention 
and reverse the features of Alzheimer's disease in these AD mice, that would be really exciting. And that's kind of the feedback that we've been getting interacting with these groups. Um, when we were awarded this golden ticket, which provides us with a year of lab space in Kendall Square, uh, we had a number of conversations with different groups. And as you pointed out, um, the real key experiments are getting this in vivo data in the Alzheimer's disease mice. And so that's, that's really our next goal. Um, we've accomplished you know, securing a lab space, which is great. And we've hired our first employee. And now um, with some research support uh, from Brown, from Grants, and then now we're also raising funds um, to, to advance this mission. The, the real next goal is to uh, get the proof of concept in the Alzheimer's mice. So in terms of timing, uh, right now we're screening drug candidates um, and this is done in cells. And then once we identify the most promising drug candidates, then those are what uh, actually make it into the animals. So we're, we're hoping to complete those experiments and get in vivo data in Alzheimer's mice within the next six to nine months. Okay, I'll, I'll take a, a question. Um, does your therapeutic increase neurogenesis throughout the brain or specifically in the hippocampus? And if throughout, what are the potential drawbacks for, the, for neurogenesis in areas that don't need it? And then how easy or feasible is it to select new target areas? And do you anticipate that this might also be used for you know, performance boosting in healthy uh, people? So it's a long question to pick the part. Yeah. Ex excellent questions. Um, so right now we're targeting neural stem cells and based on the human literature that we have available, those are located in two particular regions of the brain, um, with the hippocampus being one of them and the other the striatum, which is the area of the brain that's primarily affected in Huntington's disease. Um, so we believe that there are a number of indications where this might be useful, but due to the relatively restricted uh, distribution of neural stem cells, we think that this, this process of enhancing the neurogenesis will have uh, an impact on just a couple specific brain regions. Um, with respect to you know, cognitive enhancing medicines, um, it's certainly a possibility. Right now, we're really focused on uh, the clinical need. Um, and so we're, we're really driven by the literature on, on Alzheimer's disease. But um, I would say that it's, it is a possibility. Um, but that's not really our focus at this time. Another question, Anisha? The, the only piece of my question that, that was still outstanding was on the capital front. Would be curious how much capital you think it'll take to hit those next couple of milestones. And then if you are successful, what, what do you think the next steps look like in terms of capital needs? Sure. Um, You've so, got about 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, the short answer is probably on the order of $50,000 in addition to what we currently have in hand. Uh, if we have the in vivo uh, proof of concept data, we think that that would merit a much larger fundraise and we've generated interest so far to suggest that we could be successful in doing so. Thank you. Terrific. Nice job. Okay, we're going to move on to Castor. Hi, I'm Kaylin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Castor, an amateur social podcasting app. Hi, and I'm Arik, the co-founder and CTO of Castor. After stepping foot onto campus three years ago, we launched and scaled an FM radio station to tens of thousands of loyal listeners. While building out the station, we noticed something really special happening. Brown students and faculty alone launched over 30 podcasts over a one-year time span. Podcasting has essentially allowed anyone to host their own talk show. We validated these observations at the station within the larger podcasting ecosystem. There are over 43 million podcast episodes globally, up from only 18.5 million in 2018. In fact, one third of all Americans who listen to podcasts monthly only started listening in the last three years, representing a $9.3 billion market growing at 28%. This isn't surprising at all. It's easier than ever to consume and produce content. With 157 million smart speakers in the US and 60 million wireless AirPods sold in 2019 alone, these days, audio goes with you wirelessly everywhere. Moreover, barriers to creating content have drastically decreased with the advent of one-click podcast distribution tools like Anchor. But dominant podcast players still don't get it. 
We talked to hundreds of new creators and listeners and found that it's harder than ever to, one, gain listenership on dominant platforms because recommendation algorithms bias those with pre-existing followings, two, interact and engage with content as users frequently take notes elsewhere or just try to recall their favorite parts from memory, and three, connect with others. Many go to third-party platforms like Reddit, where there's a subgroup of 2 million users dedicated to discussing and reviewing podcasts. Here, we can see just how many podcasters are out there and just how concentrated listenership is at the top. This is why Castor is focusing on those circled, the new podcasters who are creating high-quality content yet not being surfaced to listeners at all. Today, we've built a fully functional product and serve two types of users. The first, listeners. Castor is the place to be if you want to discover the next big podcaster before they get big, because we exclusively host an amateur content library. And if you hate taking notes elsewhere on your favorite episodes, just clip the audio directly and take notes on it all in app. You can organize these clips into categories and then post it to the social community feed where all of your friends' clips are. Castor is also the place to be if you're a new podcast creator. Start from scratch like everyone else and grow both your personal creator profile with public stats on your likes, comments, and listener snippets. You can also pinpoint exactly what listeners like the most about your content through our social analytics dashboard with insights on listeners' audio snippets and comments. Castor is completely different in that we are intentionally not hosting every podcast under the sun. Our content library is for fresh creators and unlike other podcasting apps like Spotify and Apple who focus solely on content distribution, we built Castor from the ground up to truly be social first, embedding features natively onto our platform like audio snippeting, social feeds, and in-episode commenting. We think that there's a lot of potential to monetize these community interactions themselves, where users can directly buy coins on Castor called Castor Devs. They can earn these by using social features on Castor as well. They can then spend these Castor Devs on exclusive creator events, content, and merchandise. We're also the best team to be building this. We have experience launching and running a radio station, and we host and produce podcasts ourselves. We are our own users. Plus, we've worked at top tech companies like Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. So we know what it takes to scale a consumer product to millions. Just last year, we released a closed beta to 100 users. After iterating off their feedback, we now have over 250 podcasts and 14,000 episodes across 23 different colleges. With 25,000 from Brown Venture Prize, we'll have the means to launch a go-to-market strategy across college campuses, upgrade to AWS, and test our super fan marketplace to begin generating our first revenue streams. Just like TikTok is to videos and Instagram is to photos, we want Castor to be the center of everyday social podcasting. Thanks for listening. You can go ahead and sign up for Castor now on castor.com on your desktop or phone. Terrific. We're going to turn it over to Bernadette and to Richie. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'll, I, I, I'm so impressed. I've seen the product. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what the continued rollout is going to be in terms of both campus adoption? Um, is there any relationship with the institutions as you kind of grow? Um, and then also, can you just touch on, you know, there's a lot of conversation about curation and quality assurance. Um, you know, what, what do you foresee the involvement of, of you as caster in terms of determining the right type of content, uh, even topically, or is it really the community that votes things up or down? So talk a little bit about your continued growth and outreach plan. And then if you can talk a little bit about, obviously, as you continue to see growth in the, in the, um, in the podcasters themselves, how you're going to manage that over time. Sure. So on the first part of that for the campus rollout, um, you know, we've really sourced our content so far by identifying who exactly is creating content on campus around us um, and on other college campuses as well, um, because we think that it will create a more natural community interaction between people that actually know each other. Uh, and because college campuses are so centered um, on communities themselves, um, we think that people will be more inclined to use the social features on Castor. So that's kind of been our go-to-market approach. Um, so over the next couple of weeks, as we actually launch this publicly, um, we'd love to just be able to uh, get a couple people at each different um, college campus and serve as brand ambassadors where they can kind of encourage their friends uh, to sign up. And then people can um, understand that there's actually people creating content around them. 
On the curation side, that's a really great point. That's exactly what Castor is really facilitating um, because everything is user generated content. People are snipping audio, they're attaching notes to it, and then they're posting it to a social feed. Uh, and next week, we're actually rolling out another feature where they're able to kind of create these Pinterest like audio boards uh, on their own personal profile so that others can see what they're listening to and how they're ca categorized. We really think that it's up to the user. We don't want to add in too much manual curation on what exactly are, are being displayed. We want people to find these things organically by looking at their friend networks uh, and just by looking at the wider caster community to see exactly what's happening. All right, great job as a content creator. I love the concept, uh, but I would love if you talked a little bit more about uh, potential revenue streams. I know that you mentioned the caster dubs, but um, what if any other revenue streams have you considered? Um, so I guess uh, we've talked about monetization for a while, um, and traditionally a lot of content streaming platforms use ads as their primary monetization model. Um, and we've decided to not go with that uh, because we think that it impedes a lot of the social interactivity that we would like to see on Caster. Um, and so with this super fan marketplace strategy that we've sort of devised, um, we think it's the best way uh, to sort of bring the revenue directly to the content creators so they can sort of grow um, directly from it. And super fan marketplaces aren't really a new concept. Um, there's been great success with it uh, internationally, especially in Asian countries. And actually, most recently in the US, um, we can see Twitch being the prime example of a super fan marketplace, uh, really being the uh, predominant way of generating revenue. Um, so we think that this is probably the most sustainable way to grow Caster, uh, because it makes Caster sort of the creator first platform that we're all looking for, uh, but it also incentivizes listener and creator interactions in a way that just isn't possible on other platforms. Okay, thank you. You got about eight seconds if you wanna say anything else, but otherwise really nice job. And uh, we'll probably move on to uh, Cress Health. Thank you, guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Justin, and I'm one of the co-founders of Crest Health. And here at Crest, we develop digital technologies to enhance your mental wellness. So our nation is currently facing an unprecedented mental health crisis, with one in three Americans having felt feelings of depression or anxiety. And this has led to a 66% increase in mental wellness app usage in the past year alone. And having experienced these feelings myself, I tried out all of the major mental wellness apps, but soon realized they shared three key flaws. First, current apps offer little to no guidance after registration, and this isolates users who may be new or inexperienced with wellness. Second, they're just way too one-dimensional, meaning they solely limit themselves to one wellness technique like meditation. And finally, they're just not personalized to user lifestyle habits and goals. And those are really important when it comes to practicing wellness. So after talking with over 300 individuals, I realized I wasn't alone. And to address these limitations, we created Cali, which is the first mental wellness app that is your all-in-one one-stop shop for wellness that can replace all others. So to quickly run through our product, first we have our mood journaling where you can track your emotional health and other lifestyle metrics like sleep, exercise, and mental breaks. And second, we have our extensive wellness technique library, which has over 100 different dynamic audio-visual wellness techniques, including meditations, self-affirmations, encouragements, and more. And finally, we have Cali, your personal AI wellness coach. And Cali guides you through every single step of your wellness journey and crafts a personalized wellness plan to your specific goals and lifestyle. So Cali differentiates itself in the market by offering an integrated value proposition. We combine guidance through our AI wellness coach, multiple wellness techniques through our extensive library, and have user lifestyle and goal personalization to enhance wellness to the fullest. And we officially launched January and our users so far have reported less stress, improved sleep quality and greater motivation after using Cali. And people have been really resonating with our product. And here's what one of our users had to say about their experience. 
So our go-to-market strategy consists of two major channels. First, we go B2C under a freemium subscription model on the Apple and Android app stores. And second, we go B2B through group subscriptions with organizations. And we're officially partnered with Microsoft to co-sell Cali alongside Microsoft products to enterprise clients. And we have over $1,000 in revenue so far. And given the rising number of people who need our help, we see this as a $4.1 billion market opportunity. So we have groups from the following organizations using Cali, including Amita Health, which is one of the largest healthcare systems in the Midwest. And leading this venture, we have a top-notch founding team with Yusuf and I leading product while Michael leads strategy and operations. And we also have an amazing advisory board consisting of thought leaders in mental health and business advisors who've created their own successful companies. We've been fortunate to have had our app featured in a variety of media outlets, including Wire Magazine, Fast Company, and more. And we've also had a chance to make a global impact as a venture. We officially partnered with the United Nations, the Clinton Foundation, and the Jesuit Refugee Service to provide cost-free mental wellness resources to the Kakuma Refugee Camp, which is one of the largest refugee camps in the world. So winning BVP will be a huge milestone for us as a venture. We all personally plan to work full-time on it this upcoming summer. And winning BVP will allow us to accelerate our impact by developing an admin wellness portal for our clients and increasing our efforts in marketing and sales. So to end, we're at Crest Health and we're trying to enhance how people practice mental wellness. Thank you. Great, we're gonna turn it over to Luke and Melanie. This is great. Um, such an exciting uh, opportunity here. And there's no question that you are addressing a massive need. Um, so congratulations on all of your momentum so far. I downloaded the app and the experience so far has been great. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the content development? What's proprietary to the platform, where you're gathering other content and how you plan to develop or position more content on the platform over time? Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of our content, all of it has so far been sourced in-house. So we first have, in terms of the narrations of our wellness techniques, like meditations, encouragements, self affirmations et cetera, all of that has been in-house. And it also has been developed under the guidance of our clinical advisory board, which consists of physicians and psychologists who kind of vet certain scripts. So we have that in terms of narrations and in terms of actual video audio content, we have licenses with all of those from third party platforms. And in terms of future content development, so we are right now reaching out to other kind of med meditation and encouragement and self affirmation experts in the field. And really we're looking into partnerships to bring other content into our platform that isn't just ours, but that is led by influencers and experts in the field. Yeah, congrats on getting it into the uh, into the App Store and all the early um, acclaim. Those are some nice names to have next to your product. Um, I I think my question is, is you're obviously taking a broader approach, um, and that's a differentiator. Uh, as you want to grow it, there's going to be you know um, the consumer imperative to have a hook, like a, a, a specific aspect of it that resonates and differentiates versus the com the comms of this world. Um, in your early data, is there anything that, that makes you feel confident that there's a specific aspect of the kind of three worlds within the app that is going to stand out and let you um, gas the growth without uh, uh, coming up on some, some not great economics? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so far in terms of our user traction and user feedback, we have a couple features that we realize really kind of make us stand out from like a calm or a headspace. So the first is our new journaling. Our mood journaling is very, very convenient for our users to track their emotional health and their overall wellness. And we also incorporate more lifestyle oriented metrics there too, like sleep, exercise, and frequency of mental breaks. So we found that a lot of users appreciate kind of that holistic approach to wellness that we offer through that feature. It's also a calming exercise to just, you know, reflect on your day as well. So there's that. With the mood journaling, we also have social features incorporated within them. So we do have 
essentially share functionality so people can share with their friends and family uh, with regards to their journaling entries and really just share how they're doing in terms of the wellness. So that also has been a very popular feature. And finally, another really standard feature is the wellness plans that we offer through Cali. And Cali essentially curates a daily wellness plan and literally texts it to you in an app. So it's super convenient and it takes you normally less than 10 minutes. And that's something that really differentiates us because when you kind of go on calmer headspace after registration, you're kind of feeling some choice paralysis just because it kind of, you know, <laughs> make you fend for yourself and pick your own content. So we make that super simple and we also personalize it to the user. Quick one, just to wrap up, what's the bigger opportunity, B2C or B2B? So we do intend to really pursue B2B to a fuller extent. Uh, we do, we want to experiment with both, but based off our traction so far, we think that B2B is probably the better opportunity for us at this current stage. Great, thank you guys. Really nice job. We're gonna move on to our next team, Down Ballot. Hi, my name is Arvind. I'm the founder of Down Ballot Solutions, where we bring predictive analytics to local political campaigns. If you want to run for local office, you need one thing above all, the support of your community. Building that word of mouth requires knowing two things. First, who are your likely voters? And second, where are they located? Now the Secretary of State provides all of this information. There's a few problems with how it's presented. First, it's incredibly unwieldy and so most people don't even use it. And second of all, it's just dumb data, providing no real insights about who your voters actually are. You can also hire a field organizer. While they provide voter outreach strategies, it's incredibly expensive to hire one, around $30,000, which is prohibitively expensive for a local political campaign. And then there are party tools like the NGP van and Nation Builder. However, while they're incredibly powerful, they're locked behind the party infrastructure, and you can only use them if you've been specifically tapped by the DNC or the RNC. That means challengers and independents are unwelcome to use these platforms. That's where we come in. Down Ballot is your smart and digital field organizer. We take all of this unwieldy data and we turn it into this clean, actionable data sets where algorithms provide lists of likely donors as well as likely voters so that you can figure out where your voters are and who's most likely to help support your campaign financially. Our standardized data collection means that we have the most complete and useful data set, even more than NGP Van. And our unique mapping software allows candidates to find out where exactly their voters live. That's not the only point of differentiation either. Our product is completely open. That means that anyone can use this tool, party appointments not necessary. We're a custom platform building exactly what the local consumer wants. And we're an accurate platform Split ticket voting means that our predictions outperform even vans in local races. The best part is while a field organizer costs $30,000, we cost 15 times less, a mere 2,000. The best part is our customers love us. They have touted us on everything from our canvassing ability to our ability to help them raise more funds than they've ever raised before. In 2020, we had 14 clients. 50% of them had never run before and 93% won their races. We represent a huge opportunity. Our serviceable obtainable market is $2 million per year in the Twin Cities. Our serviceable available market is $50 million per year. And our total available market is $300 million per year. We see enormous potential for this business. We're already profitable. In the last six months of 2020 alone, we turned a profit of $25,000 we're projecting 300K in revenue this year, and we'll be a $12 million company by 2025, operating under high margins of around 70 to 80%. Now, what does the future hold for Down Ballot? By this May, we will deliver our digital campaign manager software, providing a one-stop shop for managing local campaigns. We're also going to show you our mobile app, a sleek interface that anyone can use. By this November, we're aiming to have 150 clients and $300,000 in revenue. By next January, 
we're looking to refine our machine learning algorithm to a 90% accuracy about voter behavior. And by November 2022, we will have 500 clients, including clients running for the United States House of Representatives. With that, we have been down ballot. Thank you for the opportunity to present to the Brown Venture Prize. And we're looking forward to answering any questions you might have about our business. We're gonna turn it over to Bernadette and Jessica. Great, hi guys. Um, I can't think of uh, anything more timely given uh, the, uh, the election season that we've gone through. Um, so quick question, and I, and I really love that you're absolutely right. You know, I think people concentrate very much on the big national races when, you know, really what affects us, um, you know, school, education, roads, a lot of it happens at a local level. And a lot of people oftentimes don't vote in their local elections. So given how diffused you mentioned the resources are for local level races. One, can you talk a little bit about how you are going to market the product to, to get it in the hands of people who are not sophisticated political machines um, uh, so that they know about the product? And then can you talk a little bit, given kind of costs at that level, how you integrate with uh, fundraising platforms and just creatively, how are you thinking about making price accessible uh, to local you know, campaigns? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I can start off and then Tanner, if you want to jump in at any point, please feel free. Uh, basically, the best part about our platform is that our growth thus far has been incredibly organic. The thing about local campaigns is most of them talk to one another. Uh, we started initially only focusing on the Twin Cities, and a week later we had candidates in Texas and Arizona because they'd heard of us through word of mouth. Um, so word of mouth is a big uh, growth factor driving our, um, you know, our marketing machine. And then in addition, we're planning on you know, a Google ad buy in addition um, to our, our sales force we employ as well. Um, as far as the cost structure, you know, like I said, we aim to be a very, very accessible price point. A field organizer is basically your only good alternative, and it costs $30,000 to hire one. If you're a local campaign, you just don't have that kind of money. Um, so as far as the cost basis, you know, we see ourselves as being a very affordable alternative. We're a mission-driven company aimed at expanding access to the ballot box for anyone, regardless of their resources. Great job, guys. I think there's, uh, as Bernard had said, it's never been more important to democratize local elections. So uh, great work and great opportunity for you. Um, you mentioned that you are um, taking a world that is full of unstructured data and you're uh, leveraging that to create um, access to, to local officials for uh, the common day people. Can you talk a little bit about what um, the training data sets that you'll be using? And you showed us one, um, but there's clearly a big, big opportunity for you to enhance the recommendation piece of an aspect of, of your application and how you connect to people that um, often don't participate at the local level. So talk a little bit about uh, where you see the opportunity from an ML perspective and, and how do you grow that over time? Sure, uh, Tanner, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, so um, in principle, once you develop this data set and are filtering it through um, a plethora of surveys that campaigns are using, you can tag voters with a bunch of very valuable information. Is this person a likely voter? Are they actually going to vote? What kind of issues motivate this voter? Um, already, we've deployed some uh, machine learning on the propensity of certain voters to be donors with great success. Actually, we had an 87% success rate with predicting whether or not somebody you canvassed on the phone or in person would actually be uh, someone who'd be likely to donate to your campaign. Again, this goes to Arvin's point about us being a mission-driven um, company. Our primary goal here is to give people who wanna make change in their communities the insights to talk to the right people, to build a network so that these community or rather issues can actually be resolved. You know, at the local level, we have a lot of power to do things like address climate change, criminal justice issues, um, even gun violence, um, but a lot of these policy outcomes become intractable when to run for office, you either have to be rich or kowtow to a party apparatus. Great job, guys. I think we're out of time. Thank you. Nice job. Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, Empower You. Hi. My name is Alvia Perez, and today I'm pitching Empower You. Empower You is a startup that addresses educational disparities by providing students with the resources they need to obtain higher education and improve the quality of their lives. 
We are an app that crowdsources confidence for first-generation students. And we do this by connecting students with opportunities, empowering them to dream big, and creating supportive communities. As a first-generation low-income student, I experienced educational disparities firsthand. The majority of my peers in high school did not know how to apply to college, if it was a feasible option for them, and above all, whether or not they would be able to afford it. Growing up, I didn't know anyone who had gone to college, and it wasn't until my junior year of high school that I met a fellow Latina attending a prestigious university on a full ride. She inspired me, gave me the courage to dream big, and enabled me to see the endless possibilities that were out there for students just like me. My story is similar to millions of other students across the nation. In fact, only 54% of students from lower income schools are enrolled in college. And approximately 7 million students do not have access to the tools they need to improve the quality of their lives. Access to higher education is one of the greatest challenges of our generation and COVID has only amplified this problem. Studies have shown that the number of lower income students applying to college has decreased by 28% when compared to the previous year. This evidently displays that educational inequalities are rapidly increasing and we need urgent solutions. My solution is Empower You. Empower You connects students with opportunities, empowers them to dream big, and create supportive communities. We connect students with opportunities through a sustainable database where college counselors can log in to their own personalized accounts and share resources. In addition, students can also share opportunities with their fellow peers, and these opportunities will be filtered daily to ensure reliability. Another component in Empower You is that students are able to save these resources and come back to them later to apply to them on their own schedules. We also empower students to dream big by creating a social platform where students can share their own stories and experiences that can inspire others, just like the student I met my junior year inspired me. Empower You also creates a supportive community by ensuring that users are able to connect with friends the instant they sign up for an account. Gamification will also be used to incentivize students to take advantage of these opportunities. As they apply to resources, they will be able to accumulate points and earn badges. This past summer, Empower You participated in B-Lab, in which we focused on bottom-up research and user testing. We hope to use the funding to finalize our app and roll it out to high schools all over the nation. Overall, Empower You believes that we have the solution to address educational disparities embedded within society. Support Empower You as we help millions of students all across the nation improve their lives through education. Thank you. Terrific. We're going to turn it over to Melanie and Ben. This is great. I could not agree more uh, with your thesis here and such an incredible opportunity. And I, I think we talk a lot about context setting as well. This idea of if you can see it, you can be it and having a supportive community ahead and around you to show you the path is so important. So it's really exciting to see that you're focused on this. I'd love to know, um, you know, it, it's interesting to think about the, the addressable market and who the actual target is for this. The average college student in this country is 25 years old and is working one, if not two part-time jobs. How do you think about who the target is for this? Is it just the high school student or is there a broader addressable market? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, so our, our addressable market is the high school students, but we also wanna incorporate college students and we do that through our business model. So right now we have three current business models that we hope to really validate through our beta testing. And in terms of colleges, we know that a lot of colleges spend millions of dollars, you know, promoting their institutions to diverse populations. And we feel that we can easily, you know, have them on our platform paying a small little fee, you know, to promote directly to the to our users. And therefore, that would be a great way to just um, not only in incentivize more students to be on our platform, but also like you were mentioning, um, college will be able to expand their audience members and they can also hire student ambassadors. And so if, if colleges are paying students or, or paying college admissions officers to answer or interact with our user bases, I feel like 
that would also expand our, our demographic. Great. Um, thanks, Elvia. Uh, fantastic idea. I agree with Melanie. Uh, it's a problem that needs to be solved, and, and hopefully this can uh, can take a bite out of the apple and, and, and make a dent in it. Um, similar to, to what Luke asked before, how do you think about the hook here? I imagine as a high school student, you know, you talk about gamification, but, you know, applying to college is not the most fun thing. You know, they're busy on whatever social media platforms are cool nowadays, I couldn't tell you. Um, how do you plan to, to get the hook of the students other than your guidance counselor telling you, you know, download this app? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, so essentially, I think there's so much power behind sharing your stories. And I feel like if you're able to see someone who looks like you or who resonates to you in any way, you're going to be more incentivized to, you know, get on this platform and become a daily user because every single thing that you're going to absorb, you know, content wise is going to be having a positive impact on you and on your future. And so that's where Empower You really comes in because we want to intentionally build these opportunities and these moments of power and strength. You know, the one that I was able to, to realize back when I was a junior in high school and I do not think I, I would be here today if it weren't for that amazing opportunity. And so for us, it's not only stories, but it's also connecting with your friends. Um, like I mentioned, we are going to want to um, incentivize students to be here because their friends are going to be here. They're going to be sharing these resources. We're going to be encouraging each other. I really want a supportive community. And that's very different from what's already out there. Um, a lot of ed tech apps are currently not focused on this community aspect, and they're also not focused on incentivizing students. And so right now, the most successful ed tech apps, they're just databases um, that have a collective list of scholarships. And we do so much more. You know, we want to be able to incentivize students through gamification. Our hopes would be to ultimately partner up with organizations and corporations um, that can sponsor us. And in some way, we can we can get the ball rolling and really increase the number of students who are going on to, to college and improving the quality of their lives. I know we don't have a ton of time, but I do think what you just said around the enterprise model is really interesting when you think about where these students are going to end up on the other side and developing the skills that they need to get there. How important is the corporate or the enterprise side of the marketplace to you? Yeah, it's, it's very important. Um, I feel like it's going to really solidify our gamification feature and just, you know, incentivize students because ultimately we do feel that there are so many corporations who already have a social mission to want to help more students get into higher education. And so we'd be able to help them out by partnering up with them. So we definitely feel like it's a valid idea. Um, it's very feasible and, and there is space to grow there. Perfect job. Thank you, everybody. We're going to move on to MetaCircle. Hi, my name is Jack Schaefer and I'm the CEO of MetaCircle. MetaCircle addresses health disparities by repurposing unused cancer medication. We collect leftover oral chemotherapeutic pills, ensure the medicine's quality, then redistribute the medication to patients in need. Treating cancer is expensive. In fact, the US spent $207 billion on cancer care in the past year. That is 1% of the United States GDP. But what if I told you that we waste 25% of our cancer medication. Cancer treatment plans are often adjusted due to adverse reactions, progression of the disease, or unfortunately, death, causing 41% of cancer patients to have unfinished prescriptions. This leftover viable medication is wasted. MetaCircle works to address these inefficiencies through pharmaceutical redistribution. The first step in pharmaceutical redistribution is collecting the leftover medication. Currently, patients must return unused oral cancer medication back to the dispensing pharmacy, who is then financially responsible for the disposal of the drug. Specialty pharmacies can instead donate this medication to MetaCircle. In doing so, they cut their disposal costs and receive tax credits equal to the fair market value of the medication. Once the medication arrives at our facilities in Summit, New Jersey, our technology compiles a medication history log. From there, our team of pharmacists performs quality assurance measures on each pill in the blister pack. After certification, the medication is redistributed to pharmacies where it can be dispensed to financially burdened patients. And patients need our medication since cancer costs are often unaffordable. 46% of all American cancer patients are forced to make difficult decisions between life-saving medication and everyday essentials. And this makes sense when the average cost of cancer care is $150,000. In total, 
64% of American cancer patients report cost as a barrier to health care. And while cancer costs are often unaffordable for the patient, insurance companies assume the bulk of the financial burden and thus are our target customer. Chemotherapy costs $10,000 a month on average, and insurance companies cover $8,000. MetaCircle provides insurance companies and their patients with a cheaper alternative. When a patient uses MetaCircle, their insurance company pays us $4,000, covering the cost of the patient entirely. With marginal cost of $30, we can operate as a for-profit company and scale effectively. Medical redistribution is currently legal in 39 states, with legislation in the works for the rest. The redistribution industry has moved over $100 million worth of medications, yet the sector is still in its infancy with a total accessible market of $51 billion. Our team already has experience redistributing medication. We work with Save One Life to expand their redistribution program, which has moved over $155 million worth of hemophilia factor abroad. Additionally, our medical advisor team consists of healthcare leaders, oncologists, and pharmacists. We have performed over 150 market research interviews with key stakeholders, including payers such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna, and United Healthcare, specialty pharmacies such as CVS and Diplomat, and patients. We are currently awaiting regulatory approval from the New Jersey State Board of Pharmacy and building our technology through Hatch Health, partnered with Nemic, Lifespan, and Zymedica. We are currently raising funds for our pilot program, which will cost $65,000. This pilot will test key business model assumptions, our technology, and validate MetaCircle to larger customers. All of the medication redistributed during this pilot will be donated to charitable clinics. And thus, the Brown Venture Prize grant will go directly to supporting patients who need it. At MetaCircle, we believe cost should not be a barrier to healthcare. And we hope that the Brown Venture Prize can help us accomplish this mission. Thank you. Great, we're gonna turn it over to uh, Anisha and Richard. Yeah, great pitch and a big, big mission. Really, really interesting approach to this problem. I'm curious about some of the logistical challenges, both in terms of physically moving the products, so collecting them and redistributing them and how you do all of that in an efficient and scalable way, but also the, the safety side of this and what do you need to do to get the payers comfortable? What do you need to do to get regulators comfortable? And how do you do that all efficiently as well? Absolutely. Those are great questions. And through our experience helping save one life, we really learned the logistical minutiae of redistributing medication. So all this is made possible through the use of GS1 NDC codes. These were made um, the standard of the pharmaceutical industry in 2014. These codes include the expiration date, any recall codes, the manufacturer, and the entire medication history log. By using this, our logistics are made um, basically um, immutable and our data consists of all of that information. In addition, we have pharmacists who check the medication. Um, so a, an example of one medication would look like this. And so a pharmacist can see the medication and if there's any tamper evidence, it's all on the back. And so by using this, we actually have a stronger assurance, quality assurance method than any normal um, retail or specialty pharmacy. Great. So it, it's very impressive and, and creative. The, uh, what, what kind of liability do you take on if, if the, you know, the, and have you uh, explored your own insurance to, to, with, with insurance companies to protect you? And, you know, these are literally life and death uh, situations. So um, how do you, what, even if the medication has been mishandled or uh, wrong temperature or whatever, um, you know, how, how foolproof is the, the, the quality assurance on this and how do you uh, protect your liability? Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I'm disappearing. Um, so on the side of liability, actually every legislation in these 39 states have a clause um, in their law. For New Jersey in Bill S2560, uh, Section 6, Clause 5, there's a specific direct quote that's saying that everyone involved in redistribution, as long as the proper quality assurance measures are in place, is legally protected. As Jack had mentioned, we actually do more than what your standard pharmacy is going to do. So not only are we checking every pill, but we also have chemical analytics software and we use uh, spectrometry to be able to check for impurities. 
chemotherapy is special in the fact that it doesn't have a lot of um, variations with temperature. So we can ensure that our efficacy of our medications is as good as it would be if you were getting it straight from the manufacturer. Can you spend a minute talking about the business model? What, what else did you consider as you thought about the right models? Why was this the right one? And how do you think about the right percentage and, and split? Absolutely. And so what, what we really focused on was making sure the patient and the incentives are aligned. And so what we through our bottom-up research and 250 market research interviews, we pivoted many times from everywhere from charging specialty pharmacies to donors to even federally qualified healthcare centers, so FQHCs. And what we found was the, the incentives and the reactions we got from representatives from Cigna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and United Healthcare, where their eyes really lit up and they introduced us to, to other people on their team when we brought this idea. And so at the advent of being able to reduce their cancer treatment costs, well, they had the largest incentives. And so that's why we decided to focus on them. And the split you mentioned is all from um, piloting and working with uh, representatives. So we actually worked with Optum, which is, as you know, part of United Healthcare, and we workshop those percentages and those splits. And so that's how we got that number. Great. Thank you. Terrific, guys. Really nice job. Okay. We're going to move on to Omin. Good evening. I'm Francesca Rollison, and I'm the founder of UMIN. UMIN is a nonprofit organization, and we exist to prevent and break the cycle of emotional abuse worldwide. I was first exposed to the concept of emotional abuse five years ago during a training as a peer educator. I remember learning that emotional abuse is any kind of abuse that is not physical and that it has a tremendous impact on individual sense of identity dignity, self-esteem, and mental health. And suddenly, so many things finally made sense because I came to the realization that all my life, I grew up in an emotionally abusive household without realizing it. I felt really lonely in my experience, but I soon found out that I was not the only one. According to UNICEF, around 80% of children in Madagascar have experienced emotional abuse in their household. In my country, it's very common to walk down the street and see couples fight or parents yell at their children. Nobody would say anything because that's just the way of life. After doing extensive interviewing with hundreds of people from over the world and from my own research, I have discovered that in developing countries like mine, emotional abuse is a cultural norm passed down from generation to generation and can even hinder our global development. So in 2019, I created a solution called UMEN. In my native language, UMEN is a play on words. UMEN means give, provide, and MENA means read. Through our program, we empower children and young adults by giving them the tools to spot red flags in unhealthy relationships. The benefits of tackling emotional abuse are huge. When we break the cycle, we improve the mental health and well-being of children, families, and communities. We also nurture a generation with greater self-esteem and inner strength that is capable of fostering healthy relationships. Let me share with you what we have accomplished since 2019. One, we ran successful pilot programs in 10 different schools in Madagascar. We reached over 700 students, both on the ground and online. Two, with cases of abuse on the rise during COVID, we hosted over 30 online workshops and support groups. One of the participants who benefited from our program told me that her parents used to make her feel like her accomplishments were never enough. And once she applied some of the tools we provide, such as the I statements, she said that the entire dynamic has shifted in her family and they now have more vulnerable and transparent conversations. She actually reminded me a lot about myself. Three. Because the problem is so prevalent, it is vital that we change minds and change behaviors, and it starts with raising awareness. That's why we're so excited that the importance of our work has been awarded the Davis Project for Peace, and we've been endorsed by the Clinton Foundation, MTV, and so many more. Four, through our own outreach, we extended the awareness to 13 countries, and in total, we received half a million online engagements. I currently lead a global team with diverse background and experience, and together, we have built a movement of 150 peer educators. Collectively, our advisors and mentors bring a wealth of knowledge in social entrepreneurship, international development, and the nonprofit sector. 
We are in the process of building our mobile application to scale our reach. The application provides an interactive space to train peer educators and help them learn from each other. They will share their stories, feel valued, and find resources to connect with the broader community. Our objective is to scale in Madagascar and ultimately in other emerging countries. We're looking for investments to scale our peer education model, to continue our outreach and to maintain our online platforms. We're at 150 peer educators now and we'll train 2,500 in the next two years. And I know that with the Brown Venture Prize support, we will reach that next level of impact. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Richie and Ben. Hi, Francesca. Really impressive Hello. presentation and uh, mission. Uh, my question is really about uh, how you create your training materials and what uh, sorts of affiliations, if any, you have with uh, professional counselors to really help you uh, create the content. Yes. Thank you so much. So uh, we have been working with the Social Emotional Learning Institute in the past, and that's how we have been able to do our pilot. And we're also working with uh, doctors at work and uh, teachers at uh, Duke universities who have been working in the social emotional learning field, especially in prevention. So what we do is more in the prevention, pre preventive, and we are partnering with organizations in terms of uh, the uh, providing the support for the people who are going through that, but we are more really raising awareness with, with uh, about what emotional abuse is and what are the consequences so that people are more aware of the problem in the first place, because if they don't know about it, then we cannot even open the conversation around emotional and mental health. And that's where uh, all of the, I would say the partnership in terms of um, uh, directing the people that we have been able to, to help uh, is going into uh, place. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great, uh, Francesca, great presentation. Great to see you again this year. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, talk to me about how you plan to uh, build up the team and kind of make this sustainable beyond yourself over the next two to three years. Yes, yes, and thank you again for all your feedback from last year. Uh, so uh, we have been uh, able to really uh, get this team uh, working. We have people on the management, on operation, we have people on programming, we have people on translation and uh, marketing and tech and really all of those people's people are highly skilled. We have uh, people from Brown, from uh, Dartmouth, and even people who are finalists from the Rhodes, Rhodes Scholar finalists. So really, we are passionate and we are working together. Right now, of course, we are still volunteers, but in the next years, we are hoping to hire more people and have them more committed. Um, yeah, thank you. Great. Um, do you see that there's a uh, kind of potential for more of a B2B model or how do you maybe just talk a little bit more about how you plan to, uh, with the app especially, uh, kind of reach your target audience? Yeah, so uh, like going back a little bit, everything that we have done has been face-to-face -face and it's actually, everything has been remote until COVID happened and it was easy for us to, to work on this. And it's based on the customers, uh, I would say the peer educators, but also the people in the school that their feedback that we started to work on this application. So uh, I, I see this as a way to scale our reach. Uh, everything is in Madagascar for now. And I, I saw on the comments that it's not only in Madagascar, yes, again. And uh, actually after uh, I launched this project after the B Lab pitch that I had in, in 2019. And after that, we had uh, people from all around the world who reached out to me telling me that it's not just in Madagascar. And that's why we are hoping to really scale and uh, B2B, I would say, in a way. And for the last, also for the last year, I've been invited to a lot of conferences and workshops uh, all around the world in Zimbabwe, in Canada, even here in the US at Harvard. And I've seen, I've seen people reaching out to me and telling me we need this program uh, where we are right now so yeah i think b2b for now and um as a nonprofit, we have uh we want to diversify uh the revenue how we're 
getting that, not just grants donation, but I see a potential in having those um, workshops and trainings in other settings such as uh, businesses or uh, not only in the schools, but in um, corporate words and um, yes. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. We're going to move on to the next team. Really nice job. Uh, so we're going to move on to Workista. Hi, my name is Andrew Kim. I'm here with Andrew Beck and we're Workista. Our main mission is to make freelance job search easier. As a freelance web developer for the past four years, I'm really excited for 2021 and onwards because recently, the freelancing market has been booming. Although the market has been growing steadily before COVID, the pandemic has tremendously increased the number of remote working freelancers to as high as 35 million in 2020 and is expected to continue to increase in the future. However, there's a problem that freelancers will always face. And this problem is that searching for freelance jobs is very time consuming. So to visualize this, let's try searching for a term web development on a typical freelancing website. Here's a freelance job board called Upwork. Unlike applying to regular jobs, you may have noticed that there's a lot of filters such as number of proposals, budget, client history, and so on. This is because freelance jobs have a lot of specific requirements. So filters and search boards are essential for freelancers. And notice that you may have to search through about 2,400 jobs, but this is only one job board. By the end of the search, this is what you end up with. And imagine doing this every single day until you find a project. On average, freelancers spend more than seven hours a week just searching for online jobs, which totals to an incredible 350 hours per year. And with this, for a freelancer who makes $30 an hour, that freelancer would on average lose about $10,500 annually. Thus, our solution is Workista. Workista is an AI assistant that searches through thousands of job boards and career pages all in one place. You create filters, schedule your search, and receive notifications once your job match has been found. To get started, first you need to create your filters. Creating a filter is a way to tell the assistant what type of jobs you want the assistant to search for. You can quickly search or use our advanced search where you can simply drag and drop filters to create custom and powerful logic that the AI assistant will use for its decision making. Next is scheduling and notifications. Here you can enter a day and time for the assistant to search for your jobs. Once the assistant is done searching, you'll see a curated list of matches alongside insightful analytics to help you apply. Thus, Workista can significantly expedite the search process. With Workista, we can reduce what used to be a seven hour search into just 10 minutes, which means you can save up to $10,250 annually using our automation tool. From our initial beta test, our users have provided amazing positive feedback on our product. Looking into the future, we believe Workista will be extremely scalable. While we'll initially target tech freelancers, we eventually plan to expand to other skilled professions such as consulting and writing. To access Workista, freelancers will be able to choose from our freemium or premium option that will be available at a $9.99 per month subscription. Currently, freelancers can either manually search through job boards, which as we've shown above can take countless hours, or they can apply to staffing agencies where freelancers pay up to 50% of their salaries to have agencies match them to a small number of jobs, which is both expensive and limiting. As far as our progress to date, We've completed our MVP and have begun private beta testing with over 300 freelancers on the wait list. Our goal is to finalize our product and release publicly by June of this year. The only thing we need now is the Brown Venture Prize. Our funds will be used to finalize our product and make sure we are good to go for the public release where we plan on expanding our user base to 10,000 freelancers. We're two extremely passionate Brown University students with various experiences in working with big tech startups and enterprises. I focus on project development and management, while Andrew Beck focuses on business and finance. Our mission is to make freelance job searching easier than ever before and completely change the way we find work. Together, let's build the future of work with Workista. Thank you.
Great, we're gonna turn it over to Luke and Jessica. Go for it, Jessica. Okay, great. Guys, such a great job. Um, really impressive. I, and you've really tapped into a dynamic that, uh, which is employment that I think is forever changed uh, post COVID for both employers and employees. Um, so it looks like right now you're concentrating mostly on a B2C model, um, looking to monetize the business through, um, through user membership. Can you talk to me a little bit uh, about whether you've explored a B2B opportunity of uh, being an employer myself, I would love to get my hands on uh, making it more efficient to find uh, qualified candidates. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, that opportunity and if you've considered that. So currently, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we are operating on a B2C model just because right now we believe that we want to capture as many freelancers as possible on our uh, platform. We're operating in a similar way to a Google Chrome extension you might have heard of in Honey. So they started yeah. off really acquiring a lot of users and then uh, switching over to a B2B model later on. And we do believe that in three years, once we have a really talented and skilled base of freelancers, we'll be able to sell the, that market directly to clients, uh, whether that is through sponsored job matches uh, when they get that match list uh, or through other avenues. So that is definitely something that we're exploring, but uh, currently focused more on the B2C side. Yeah, it, it definitely um, feels like great timing. And um, uh, I actually had a, originally was going to ask the same question of why not go for the deeper pockets, but there's something super compelling about being on the job seeker side uh, where uh, that just feels like an, an opportunity to differentiate on the UX in a really um, exciting way. I guess I'm curious uh, if you, if you like, I saw your business plan on it, but if you roll the um, clock forward six months or so, what would you expect to, like, what, what would you be hoping to see uh, that you haven't seen so far in the, um, in the beta users? And how do you expect to grow that, uh, uh, yeah, essentially that, that pool, of, pool of folks efficiently given the fairly low 10 bucks a month uh, premium, um, premium price? Yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so over the six months, what we are trying to focus on, like you said, is the user um, acquisition. So what we've been doing right now is we've been um, partnering up with job boards, um, such as Upwork, which is one of the largest job boards that we have talked about so far, and uh, job boards like People Per Hour and Guru. And the idea here is that we're including more people who are working for um, fighting work in these job boards, and we're trying to expand as many job boards as possible. So um, in a sense, and we also search for career pages. So uh, recently, um, the Fortune 500 companies have released uh, sort of um, contractors jobs and also freelance jobs that are specific uh, for freelancers. So we're sort of in a process of linking them together and providing uh, more opportunities for uh, the future freelancers to um, have greater access to jobs and stuff. Yeah. I have one quick question if we have, it looks like we have a, a minute. Um, so going back to the B2C model, so it's 99, 9, $9.99 a month. How do you expect to keep your monthly recurring revenue consistent given that people cycle in and out of, um, of work, project work in their own capacity? Yeah, so to answer that question, um, that's uh, definitely a great uh, concern. It's really integral to our project. Um, and it's uh, mainly based on the fact that uh, we do believe that the $9.99 month uh, per month uh, pricing model that we have right now is developed based on comparables uh, that we saw that freelancers use for SaaS products right now. Um, so given that, we do believe we have a potential for recurring revenue because of how often freelancers are finding jobs. Um, a lot of freelancers have a main job and then also two to three side projects running on the side. And that accounts for around three to four searches at least per week, if not more. Um, so really, uh, we do believe that as long as we can maintain that, uh, they will continue to come back uh, every month. So, but that is something that we will look into further. Great, thank you very much, nice job. Okay, what I'd like to do is, um congratulate all the finalists and uh, let's give them all a at least virtual round of applause if not an actual round of applause uh, i want to emphasize that 
these are eight finalists out of 31 original applications that we received. And even those 31 were um, self-selected among many, many more that might have considered entering. So already all eight have done an extraordinary job and I think the judges have the work cut out for them. Um, so really good job, all eight teams. I'm getting a flood of texts and slacks and chats about how this is, uh, the quality of these is unprecedented and, and I think they're right. So really good job, everybody. The judges are gonna to adjourn to a separate Zoom area and begin their deliberations. And uh, while we have your attention still, I wanna uh, mention that we're gonna announce a couple of really interesting things. One is we're gonna show you a very moving, I think impressive video uh, that features some past winners and you'll be interested to see uh, what they do. We're gonna ask you to participate in the fan favorite voting and we're gonna have a special um, announcer of the winner once the judges get back. Um, and uh, I also want you to stick around for even after we announce all the winners, which is gonna be really exciting because we're gonna be using a special online platform that we use, not Zoom, but um, something called Rally for some virtual networking. So I hope you'll all stick around um, at least for a little while and uh, participate in the fan favorite voting. Uh, here's some exciting news from Van Wickle Ventures and watch the uh, video about the updates. So right now you should be seeing the poll that's asking you to vote on uh, your fan favorite. And I promise not to divulge anything, even by facial expressions. Numbers are still going up, so we're going to give you just a few more, few more seconds to uh, to vote. We're we're at about seventy percent. So we'll even play a little music, and we're going to show you right here. This is what's at stake in the fan favorite. I'll even let you know that this is the same backpack, day pack, overnight bag that we have at the Nelson Center. It's from a local startup called Knack Pack. And I think these are just phenomenal. I've never seen a backpack quite as, um, as awesome as this. And so uh, looks like we're hovering around 80% of you have voted and maybe a few more are gonna vote. Um, I think we'll close the voting in, in about 30 seconds. And so, uh, and then and then we're gonna keep you in a little bit of suspense until the judges come back and we announce it officially there. But uh, if you haven't voted yet, now's your chance. Okay. How, how's that, Abby, you ready? All set. Okay. Um, I'm gonna introduce, just real briefly, introduce, um, Ved from Van Wickle Ventures. Van Wickle Ventures is our student-run venture fund. Uh, it's unusual for a university's uh, student body to have a student-run venture fund, and we're really proud of it. Um, and, and Ved has a, a special announcement about one of their upcoming ventures. Ved, take it away. Right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ved Narayan, and I'm the co-director of Van Wickle Ventures. Um, just like Danny said, VWV is a student-run venture fund that invests across all stages in Brown and RISD affiliated companies. Our fund is made up of generous donations from Brown alums, and with our capital, we back the university's groundbreaking students, faculty, and alumni. So if you're an alum looking to get involved or a student looking to learn more about what we do here at Van Wickle Ventures, please email us at vwv at brown.edu. That being said, we have some very exciting news to share. One of our main missions is to make the Brown entrepreneurial ecosystem more circular, and our latest investment reflects this goal. I'm so happy to announce that VWV has invested in the winners of last year's Brown Venture Prize, Intis Care. So happy to partner with Robbie and Evan to help change the elderly care space. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on today. I'm Robbie Felton, one of the co-founders at Intus Care here with Evan as well. And since the Brown Venture Prize last year, this opportunity has really catapulted us. So with that jumpstart funding we got from this program, we were able to go on and raise pre-seed funding. Um, we had a pretty significant pivot towards data. Uh, we were able to build our product, um, launch our product in October of 2020. And since then, we've scaled up significantly. Now we have about 2,000 patients on the platform, eight organizations across three states, and we're excited to be growing and scaling. Um, nine employees total, most of them are classmates at Brown University. So thank you again to the Nelson Center. And Evan has a few words as well. Yeah, thank you, Robbie. And, and you know, first and foremost, once again, we want to thank the Nelson Center and Jonathan Nelson really for giving us a space to foster that passion for entrepreneurship. Um, we know that's not available everywhere and, and we're really appreciative for it. Um, we also want to thank our many Brown advisors and mentors um, who've really changed the way we think about and solve problems. Um, alums like Nancy Zimmerman, Luke Sherwin, Patty Riskin, Larry Kusher, Brian McCarthy, um, and professors like Barrett Hazeltine, Jen, Naz Jen Nazarino, and Megan Ranney, just to name a few. Um, you all have really made this possible and we're extremely grateful for your time and personal investment in us. So thank you. Thank you guys. I, I was so thrilled. I said that we absolutely have to have you guys here, not only to update us as we would want you to anyway on the progress that Intus Care has made, but also because of the amazing self-supporting infrastructure that VED has now uh, described. I, I think this is the first time that Van Wickle Ventures has invested in a uh, current and real recent student launched um, venture. And certainly I think it's the first time that you have invested in a Brown Venture Prize winner. So I, I hope it's not the last time. I don't expect it will. Uh, not, will be now that you've broken the ice. I can't imagine a more um, appropriate way to indicate again, this self-sufficiency and uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled and thank you for uh, all of you being here. We're gonna transition to a little bit more information about uh, updates on what some of past winners are doing. And you're really in for a treat uh, because it's amazing to see. I love how Evan and, and Robbie described, essentially they're winning the Brown Venture Prize as a catalyst. I describe catalyst in my teaching and uh, in my classes as these small amounts of uh, seemingly, at the time, small amounts of impact that can have disproportionate impact. And I think you're going to see that that's what uh, winning the Brown Venture Prize has done for several of these winners. I'm Danny Warshe. I'm the executive director of the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. And I'm excited to share with you a few details about where the Brown Venture Prize came from. Back in 2017, Neil Parikh and Luke Sherwin came to see us and shared some perspective about how the precursor to the Brown Venture Prize had inspired them, had motivated them, and had led them to pursue their own entrepreneurship while they were students and then eventually after they graduated. They encouraged us to reignite this kind of a program and stepped up to provide the funding for the first two years of the Brown Venture Prize. In the last two years, Richard Katzman and Jane Katzman have generously stepped up to sponsor these couple of years. And we couldn't have done any of this Brown Venture Prize without Luke, without Neil, without Richard, and without Jane. Hi everyone, my name is Jack Roswell and I'm one of the co-founders of Cloud Agronomics. Congratulations to all of this year's finalists. We ended up placing second in the 2018 Brown Venture Prize that was sponsored by the Casper Founders. In 2020, we commercialized the first technology that was capable of remotely measuring carbon in farmland soils, which was previously a key barrier in unlocking farmland as a carbon sink. The check from Brown Venture Prize gave us the capital necessary to purchase our first lab-grade equipment and three years later, we've raised over $6 million in venture capital and are operating out of Boulder, Colorado with more than 20 full-time employees. 
Hi everyone, my name is Saro Matala and I'm the founder of Gota. Uh, since the uh, Brown Venture Prize, we have officially launched our first product, a super food crisp that you can have as a yogurt and salad topper or a healthy snack on the go. Uh, this is what our product looks like. We produce here in Providence, Rhode Island. We've gone a commercial kitchen where we can produce at large scale and we recently launched at What's Good, a local delivery platform. So check us out there or online on our website, uh, gotech.com. This is David, one of the co-founders of H2OK Innovations. We were one of the finalists of the Brown Venture Prize 2019 and are extremely grateful for all the support that the Brown entrepreneurship community has given us since then. For a quick overview, at H2OK Innovations, we are building an IoT analytics platform providing comprehensive real-time visibility for industrial liquid systems to enable data-driven optimized operations. Our proprietary commodity optical sensors measure liquid composition and properties at 100 times lower cost than standard industrial sensors, allowing for mass scalability. Since the Brown Venture Prize, we have gone through the Techstars Farm to Fork Accelerator, have just launched our alpha product this month, and signed 60K in contracts, with a sales pipeline of over $1.5 million. Additionally, we are also about to close our pre-seed round and are scaling up the team. Hi, I'm Abby. My name's Greg. And we're the co-founders of Recessifact, last year's third place BVP winner. And we're a medtech company that is aiming to improve outcomes from sudden cardiac arrest through training and devices for real-time response. Since participating in BVP, we've had a lot of progress. We placed first place in the MedTech track of the Rhode Island Business Competition. We're also silver finalists in Mass Challenge. Uh, we've been developing and beta testing our app with several groups of users. We're currently in our third round of beta testers. We also participated in the NIH's Driven Accelerator Hub. We also won first place in the American Heart Association's Empowered to Serve Business Accelerator, which awarded us a $40,000 grant to keep working on our technology. And we also have multiple distribution partnerships in the works to distribute our CPR training app. So we're incredibly excited to keep distributing our app that makes people confident and capable of doing CPR. Hi, Brown community. This is Emma Butler, second place winner at BVP 2020 from Intimately. I am so grateful for BVP and everything that it has done for us. It was really a kickstarting launching point for Intimately. Since last March, we won first place in another pitch competition, Smith College's Draper competition in August for $25,000. We've grown our team to eight women of disabled women and able-bodied allies in New York. Um, Rhode Island and I'm calling in from Paris. We've also been working really hard on our own line, which by the time you see this should be live on our website, intimately.co. And we also are now raising a seed round. Hey everybody, this is Evan Jackson from Intiscare. And for us, winning the Brown Venture Prize was crucial in expediting our sales process and our go-to-market. Since winning the prize in 2020, we're fortunate to now be working with seven long-term care organizations across three states, serving over 2,000 patients and recording six figures in annual recurring revenue. Now, none of this would have been possible without the support of the Brown Venture Prize and the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship, and we're extremely grateful to be a part of that community. Good luck to the finalists, and shout out to the team at Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship for continuing to foster a community of innovation and entrepreneurship at Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brown Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship for all you have done for Intimately. Let's go forward and keep including everyone from all backgrounds and really making a change. Good luck, guys. Good luck to all the finalists. And I'm, I'm excited to see how you all build companies that can change the world. Hey there. My name is Jaina Zwyman. I was a juror back in 2019 and I'm Brown class of 01. Being a juror was such an honor and really exciting. It was wonderful to see everything that students have been working on and doing and really making out of nothing. And it is just such a great night. I wish everyone a wonderful night. Good luck communicating your ideas and can't wait to see what you come up with. Hi, this is Bernadette Alestia. I am a BVP judge for the second year in a row. And uh, I have to say, this year is the best. 
Uh, I'm amazed at just how thoughtful and thorough the pitches were, and I'm so proud of every single one of you. I can't wait to see um, where all of your ventures go, but of course, there can only be one winner, and I can't wait to see who that is. We're going to ask um, a, a beloved member of our community, somebody who's contributed enormous value to Brown and to uh, entrepreneurship at Brown. Um, Barrett Hazeltine was a professor of mine and set me on my path um, of something that at the time I didn't even know was called entrepreneurship. And I can imagine that virtually everybody here tonight owes a significant debt of gratitude to Barrett for all that he did even long before such a center as ours was even envisioned. So Barrett, we're gonna give you the honor of announcing this year's fan favorite. And the winning prize for that is, is this essentially. Um, I miss using this too, because I don't need a backpack when I walk up to my third floor office, but um, it's a fantastic backpack and an overnight bag from a local startup called Knackpack. And so Barrett, I'm gonna turn um, the uh, mic over to you to announce this year's fan favorite. Well, thank you, Danny. And uh, I must say, it's a great pleasure to see all these people and uh, uh, just see the quality of the presentations and uh, very pleased to announce that the uh, fan favorite is MediCycle. You can unmic. Yay! Good job, Meta Circle. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Professor Hazel team. Thank you very much, Barrett, for being yeah. with us tonight, as you are at so many of our events. Uh, congratulations to Jack and Louise and, and Eliza, and uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. High praise from um, Barrett Hazel team. Okay, and uh, now we're going to announce the three winners of the. Um, money prizes. We're going to start with Ben Chesler, who's going to announce the third prize winner. And uh, Ben, just make sure you unmute yourself and uh, take it away. All right. Uh, can I get, can we get, can we get a drum roll? Can people unmute themselves? We get a quick drum roll here. We needed that drum roll. Yes. <laughs> Great. That works way better in person. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am I am honored and stoked and excited to announce uh, that the third uh, place winner in this year's Brown Venture Prize is Empower You. And people, are wel people are welcome to unmute themselves and congratulations! Clap, really, oh, wow. and Thank you so much. Congratulations, <laughs> Alvia! Congrats. Really nice job. Amazing idea, Alvia. Well deserved. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And now we're going to uh, turn it over to Richie for uh, to announce the second prize winner. And um, if if after you announce the winner, people would like to unmute themselves and clap, that would be great. All right. Well, it is my pleasure. Well, first of all, I have to tell you guys, it was very difficult for the judges. All of you did an amazing job. But it is my pleasure, particularly as a content creator, to congratulate Caster as the second place winner this year. You might even have me podcasting. So congratulations. Woo! Yay! Thank congratulations. Nice so job, Caster. Nice, nice job, judges, so far. Pretty tough, I know. Um, and now, this really deserves a big drum roll. Um, we're going to have Richard Katzman uh, step up and announce this year's first prize winner. Richard, take it away. Okay. Um, well, I want to thank all of the, the, the 31 people, uh, teams that applied, the, uh, the finalists for making our job impossible this year. Um, there were so many great presentations. Um, but when it came down to uh, all of the considerations, the judges um, had a selection and I'm glad that they have a backpack to put that big check in and the winner is MediCircle. So congratulations. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. Go New Jersey. Oh my God. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, everybody. We the really appreciate it. Oh, my God. Really great job, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Very proud of you, That's just like Barrett said. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah. Well done. I think, yeah, uh, I'll say that I think the, uh, the, the final uh, um, piece that got you the, the first place was knowing the exact clause in that law. <laughs> <laughs> we spent all morning going over that. We looked through the whole legislation, so. That was a funny book. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Terrific job. <laughs> and um, so I, I really do want to thank all eight teams. I'm so glad that we delegated the responsibility of judging this to our esteemed uh, alumni panel. It, it would have been very difficult and they did a good job. Um, three cash winners, but really uh, the other five are winners too. And there's many previous runners up who have gone on to launch their companies and have done tremendous work, uh, regardless of whether they've won money in this process. So uh, we look forward to being supportive of all of you, of all 31 teams, and to anybody else who's out there who is looking to this as uh, inspiration, we'd love for you to come to the Nelson Center and benefit from all the resources we have even earlier in the pipeline. We hope this has been a really worthwhile and inspirational um, opportunity. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna transition to the rally platform you'll see in the chat a link for how to get there. The chat won't be available after we all are there. So um, either click on it or um, uh, cut a copy and paste it into your browser. I encourage you all to come. You'll be able to interact with the winners, um, with all the, all the eight teams. If you have something to offer them, as many of you did by offering it in the chat, please come to the Rally Networking. And then there will be many of you who um, are eager to just meet and network and uh, make good contacts. I and the rest of our staff will be there as will the judges. So thank you to Abby, Liz, Jonas, um, Fabi, Alyssa, uh, Sheila, and all, the, all the, um, the teams for tonight. We couldn't have done anywhere close what we did without you. We hope this is the last time we will be doing the Brown Venture Prize competition uh, fully online next year for sure uh, on campus. So I will see you in a couple minutes uh, on the rally platform. <laughs>